Bible or a pew Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. Samuel anoints David. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Beth Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed, anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Sh Shema, Sh Shema pass, be, pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Our second reading comes from Matthew 26, 6 through 13, the anointing at Bethany. You are invited to stand for the gospel reading as you are willing and able. Now when Jesse was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive anointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this anointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Join with me in prayer. Lord, we gather before you to, to understand your word, your will, your purpose for our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that as we meditate on your word that was read this morning, as we consider the message that has been prepared, Lord, that you will work in our hearts that your truth, your will, and your purpose will be revealed to us in the ways that only you can do, Lord. And so I pray that the words of my mouth and 
the meditation of our hearts, that they will be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I can honestly say from the depths of my heart that I am grateful for the Methodist roots that I have come to know and to understand. For Methodism is much more than a denomination. John Wesley is known as the father of Methodism. However, he never intended to create a new denomination. This was a movement of the Holy Spirit that was far greater than John Wesley or any other man. And the reality is that today there are more than 30 Methodist denominations in the United States alone. I believe the reason for this is rooted in the teachings of John Wesley, in which he says it is the spirit that sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts and the love of all mankind, thereby purifying our hearts from the ways of the world. Before Methodism was a, a church, before it was a denomination, Methodists gathered together in homes and in small groups. And in their small groups, they would begin with a simple question. Is it well with your soul? In the Hebrew context, the soul is the, the total of the mind, the body, and the spirit. And so to ask, is it well with your soul, is to ask about your overall well-being, spiritually, and physically, emotionally. And while this is a good question to consider when gathering together, a better question might be, is it well with your heart? You see, the more science reveals about the heart, the more we come to understand the teachings about the heart as it is found in Scripture. Jesus teaches that all we think and all we say originates from the heart. There's a scientific study that was done a couple of years ago by the Institute of Heart Math. And it reveals that our, our feelings and our emotions, that they do not originate in the brain, but in the heart. For example, when we experience emotions such as gratitude or joy, the heart beats out a different message than when we experience fingers, uh, feelings of anger or regret. And according to these studies, these heartbeats either send a positive message or a negative message to the brain. It is for this reason that the scripture says, let your hearts be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments. Then and only then will we come to know wholeness in our lives. Only then will we know the peace of Christ in mind, body, and spirit. That is, in our soul. And so when King Saul failed to keep the commandments of the Lord, Samuel admonished him, saying, Now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And following the battle with the Amalekites, as we heard about last week, Samuel left Saul and he returned to his hometown of Ramah. And it would be the last time that Samuel and Saul would see each other. And Samuel mourned for Saul. The Hebrew word translated as to mourn is better translated as to lament or to go into mourning as if to mourn for the loss of a loved one. And even as a young boy, Samuel knew this type of loss. He knew this type of grief. For as a young boy, he was called by God to deliver a word, a word of destruction to the man who raised him up as a child, that is, Eli, the, the priest at Shiloh. And as a priest, Eli practiced only partial obedience before God. And as a result, his sons practiced total disobedience in their ministry to God. For this reason, God put an end to the priestly line of Eli and his sons. 
And so from a very young age, Samuel came to know that disobedience before God would lead to destruction. And so when King Saul, the first king of Israel, was disobedient to God, Samuel mourned. The truth is God knows our grief. And so he established times for mourning. From Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we learn that there's a time and a purpose under heaven for all things. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to weep and a, a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Now we do not know how long Saul mourned for, or Samuel mourned for Saul, but, but we do know that God provided the time for Samuel to, to mourn. Jesus taught us that those who mourn, that they will be blessed, they will be comforted. And this was Samuel's experience as was revealed in our scripture, read, scripture reading this morning. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. In the depth of his grief, God provided Samuel a new hope, for God was about to raise up a new king, a man after his own heart. The time of mourning had come to an end. Now it was a time for renewed hope. Now it was a time to move forward, trusting God to provide the way. But this is not always easy. It's not always easy to move forward. It's not always easy to trust God. This too was Samuel's experience. For when God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king, Samuel responded with fear. He responded saying, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. Now to be fair, Samuel's fears were not unfounded. And for the spirit of God had departed from Saul, and Saul's spirit became troubled. Samuel knew that if Saul found out he was anointing a new king for Israel, that Saul would surely have Samuel killed. So when Samuel inquired of the Lord, saying, how can I go? He was asking a very practical question. And so God gave him a very practical answer. He said, take your heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And while God was sending Samuel to anoint the future king of Israel, this was not to be made known publicly. Rather, God sent him to Bethlehem to lift up an offering before God with the elders of the town and with Jesse and his sons as honored guests. And God did not abandon Samuel in this task, for God said he would go with him. He said, I will show you what you shall do. And that is exactly what happened. Now I want you to pay close attention to this passage to these verses. First, Samuel feared for his own life. Second, God gave, him, gave understanding to Samuel of what would happen. And third, Samuel was obedient to do what God had commanded without fear. This is why it is of the, the utmost important to, to study and to know the word of God intimately. For it is through his word that we come to understanding. And it is through understanding that we learn obedience to God. It is through understanding of his word that we learn to overcome fear. Amen? Amen. Amen. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And he said to the elders of the town, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. To consecrate means to make holy. To make holy means to be set apart. That is to be set apart for God and from the ways of the world. And while the elders of the town were sent to consecrate themselves, 
for the sacrifice, it would be Samuel who would consecrate Jesse and his sons personally. And when the sons of Jesse became, came before Samuel, Samuel immediately set his eyes on the, the firstborn, the eldest son, whose name was Eliab, which means God is father. And Samuel marveled at his appearance and at his height. And he said to himself, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Yet God said to Samuel, I will show you what you shall do. And concerning Eliab, God said, do not look on his appearance or on his height or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. Seven sons of Jesse would pass before Samuel, and seven sons would be rejected by God as the future king of Israel. Let us consider what Jesus says about the heart. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He says, the word of God is sown in the heart, and forgiveness and love comes from the heart. He tells us to pray persistently that we may not lose heart. And he gives us this promise saying, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Praise be to God. Therefore, the one that God would choose to be the future king of Israel would have to be a man after his own heart. And Jesse had one son remaining, the youngest, and the least important amongst all his sons, David. Samuel instructed Jesse to call David to him, and when David stepped before Samuel, God said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took a horn of oil, and he anointed him in the midst of all his brothers. Samuel consecrated Jesse and all of his sons, However, David was the only one to be anointed. And so what does it mean to be anointed? The first to be anointed as found in the scripture was not a man. It wasn't a woman. It was a monument to God. When God affirmed his covenant with Jacob at Bethel, the one to, to whom he gave the name Israel, Jacob set up a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he made a vow saying the Lord will be my God. The act of anointing in this case was an act of worship. The Hebrew word translated as to anoint is kadash, which means to make and to pronounce as clean, to sanctify, to make holy. It is in the time of Exodus when God instructs the Israelites to anoint all that which is holy in this service to God. From Exodus chapter 30 it says, You shall make a sacred anointing oil. It shall be holy. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the covenant, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and the altar of burnt offering. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy holy, and whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. You see, all that was anointed was considered holy before God. And all that came in contact with that which had been consecrated became holy. Therefore, all instruments and persons used in the service of God are to be consecrated, to be set apart according to his will and for his purpose, for they are holy to him. Samuel anointed David, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him from that day forward. And because the Spirit of God was with David all the days of his life, we know the Psalms of David to be prophetic. When the Psalm declares you have given him dominion over the work of your hands, 
You have put all things under his feet. It points directly to the authority of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who was yet to come. In our gospel reading from this morning, we find Jesus at the house of Simon the leper. We know from John's account that this happened six days before Jesus would be crucified. For the next day, he would enter into Jerusalem on a colt with the foal of a donkey. We also know from John's gospel that the woman who anointed Jesus was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. The scripture says Mary poured a very expensive anointment, ointment on his head as he climbed at the table, and that she anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping his feet with her hair, and that the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Now we should not understand this act of anointing as an act of setting Jesus apart for God, for Jesus Christ is God. He is our Lord. He is the great I Am. Rather, we should understand this as this act of anointing as an act of worship. As when Jacob set up a pillar and poured oil on top of it. In this way, Mary was declaring Jesus to be He who is most holy. Mary is mentioned by name three times in the Gospels, and in each case we find her at the feet of Jesus. This is an act of worship. This is an act of devotion. It is in the Gospel of Mark where we find out that the ointment used to anoint sorry, where we find out the anointment Mary used to anoint Jesus' head and feet could have been sold for 300 denarii. That is equal to one year's wages. In this way it was truly an extravagant act of worship. It was an offering which was considered holy in God's sight. And when the disciples protested, saying the money could have been given to the poor, Jesus rebuked them. He said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. For you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Now, there are two things we can learn from what Jesus said to his disciples. One, Christ is to be the first and the foremost in everything we do. Do not neglect your worship of him. And two, he expects that we will make time for those who are poor. That we will spend time with those who are without. For you will always have the poor with you. This we must not neglect. Jesus said of Mary, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body before him for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Theologian Warren W. Wearsby says this about Mary's act. He says, Jesus rebuked Judas and the other disciples, and he praised Mary for her loving act of devotion. Nothing given to Jesus is in love is ever wasted. Her act of worship not only brought joy to the heart of Jesus and fragrance to the house, but also blessings to the whole world. Her devotion encourages us to love and serve Christ with our very best. Therefore, let us be obedient to the word of God. Let your heart be wholly true to the Lord, walking in his statutes and in his commandments, that you may be blessed and found to be pure in heart. For the word of God is sown within the heart, and forgiveness and love flow from the heart, and then you will truly be able to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is for this and for all these things that we give all praise, honor, and glory to God the Father, to God the Son, and to God the Holy Spirit. Let all the people say, Amen. Amen.